Oh, he's on twice. Yeah. Oh, there you like are. Just Tim. There you are. There you are. There you are. Great. Pin, pin, pin. There we are. There's all three of us. Okay. Ready. Oh my God. And we got a CCE person. Exciting. Oh my gosh. Okay. Great. Here we go. Ready? I'm hitting record in two seconds. One, two, three. Nope. I did not. I don't know what I'm doing. We already hit record so long ago. So let me just officially start a day. I had meetings starting at like 745 already. So, all right. So welcome everybody to one of our most exciting, hopefully announcements, webinars that I certainly have had um, the pleasure of organizing. And uh, yeah, we are announcing a project called the New York Farmland Access Fund. We want everybody to hear about this all over the place over the next few years. And I, when I heard about it from Carissa from American Farmland Trust, who is also on the screen here, she convinced me over the course of a very brief phone conversation to pledge $1 million over the next five years, which is a slightly shocking amount of uh, money. And hilariously or not so hilariously, not even nearly enough of what, you know, we would need to make even more of an impact in, uh, in the area of protecting agriculture, supporting underserved farmers, helping people really get off the ground with new, uh, farms and farms that are, have been in transition in New York state. And I'm going to introduce these guys in a second, but what I learned, I'm Megan Brenway should say that first from Upstate Curious and Upstate Curious is a mostly a business focused on real estate. We have the real estate team, Upstate Curious team of Keller Williams Realty, Hudson Valley North, of which I am am an associate real estate broker. We work across 11 counties and obviously we're aware that prices are, you know, increasing everywhere. Prices for land are increasing and there is a lot of farmland that is might be not farmland in the not too distant future, unless people take some, you know, more proactive steps towards preserving it. And when I met with Chris, and when I learned about this project, we were so excited to get involved. And I think, and I hope that the rest of you will be equally as excited because there's going to be plenty of opportunities for everyone to get involved. And as much as, you know, we, we need to, and want to raise this million dollars over the next five years, we are committed to also spreading as much information as possible about regenerative agriculture, about um, about all of the issues surrounding what what it takes to be a small farmer in this area, and also particular challenges that people face who have um, you know generationally faced legal, social, and all kinds of obstacles to having farmland in this area. At the same time, there are these guys, Tim and Chris, I can say more about this, but there are a lot of farmers nearing, you know, retirement age or the age where they no longer will be able to farm their land or want to farm their land who don't have succession plans in New York state. And this is a moment that to me is like, it's particularly important to kind of, and I know it sounds maybe weird for a real estate person to be like, to save this farmland from real estate development, but I'm all for real estate development. I'm all for, you know, workforce housing and cluster development and townhouses and, you know, appropriate buildings and appropriate places. But I am for sure all for preserving the farmland in this area in particular. And the program is going to be all across New York State. And so without further ado, I think I want to actually invite Carissa to come on and explain who you are, a little bit about AFT and the genesis of the project. And then we have Tim who is a program manager and a farmer and can put both hats on at different times here. And yeah, I'll, Chris, I'll let you take the floor for a minute here. Great, super. Thank you, Megan. Thank you so much. And I first just want to underscore, you know, our, our incredible gratitude for Upstate Curious for being a, uh, you know, a, a lead sponsor of this uh, project. We're we're just so excited to be working with Megan and her team who have been warm and you know enthusiastic and, and bringing all of you to into our network and into 
uh, learning more. Um, so I'm Carissa Centeni. I am based in uh, Troy, New York, a little further upstate than where Upstate Curious is mostly working in Rensselaer County. Um, I uh, have been with AFT, American Farmland Trust, for three years. I'm a senior philanthropy officer. Uh, so just a little bit about this, this project, um, you know, I think it was uh, 2020 when we were really beginning to conceptualize it in, in part in response to um, just the extraordinary uptick in farmland costs, uh, specifically in the Hudson Valley, as we saw lots of folks from New York City moving upstate, some buying farmland, um, and and some of those folks joined, you know, our, our non-operating landowners network, which, you know, mm -hmm. again, great program for uh, education, uh, great educational program for non-operating landowners to learn more about some of the challenges um, farmers face, including access to farmland. Um, and, and that was wonderful, but we really sort of learned quickly and, and AFT, has a 40 year history, I think a 32 year history working in New York state. So we know what some of the challenges have been for farmers, but we've really seen them exacerbated since 2020. And thanks to a sort of extraordinary gift from uh, two lead donors, a $1.25 million gift to start the New York Farmland Access Fund, we were able to, to build this concept out, um, bring up State Curious into the fold to help match that 1.25. The other 250 has also been matched. So. We've got a really nice pot to, to begin to do good work with uh, of um, $2.5 million. And this Farmland Access Fund, uh, the first project that we do will be in either Dutchess or Columbia counties. Um, there's a couple of reasons for that. One is that's where farmland is extraordinarily expensive and we're seeing a lot of development pressure. We're also seeing some solar development pressure. So we just feel like this is, it's also where we have a network currently and um, just want to start there. But like Megan said, this whole program will, will grow across New York State. It's a revolving fund. So once we do the first project, and by that, I mean, uh, you know, AFT will um, identify farmland that um, is either under development pressure or uh, for sale by a farmer who's needing to retire, needs that retirement money, will you know, through this fund be able to purchase that and then if it's not protected yet, we'll work with one of the local land trusts to, um, and, and we're a land trust ourselves, where land trusts don't exist, we can do this as well, but we'll protect that property, bring the cost of it down. We can also add affordability covenants to essentially make it more accessible um, and accessible to, like Megan said, historically underserved farmers. Um, and we'll talk more about that as we get into some of the details, but we want, to you know, ensure that farmland continues to be farmed. We want to help uh, specifically BIPOC and LGBTQ farmers gain access to farmland um, if they haven't um, had that in the past. And this is, this is one way to do it. And of course, our team is committed to helping these projects thrive. So once we get farmers on the land and help with that piece, we'll also continue to help through providing technical assistance and business technical assistance to ensure that Number one, these farms stay viable. And number two, that farmers are, are deepening any regenerative practices they're using um, so that these projects are, are, of course, good for the farmers, they're, they're good for the land, and they're, they're good for the community. Um, that's everything in a nutshell. And I'd love to pass the mic to my colleague, Tim Bello, who uh, will talk a little bit more about his role and, and sort of his path to farmland access as a farmer. Um, Tim, go ahead. Yeah. Sure. Am I coming through okay? Can you hear me? Yep. You're good. Great. Great. Well, thanks so much for having us. It's really nice to be here. And uh, yeah, as Chris uh, and Megan said, my name is Tim. Uh, I work, so I have my two hats, which I'll I'll have on and off uh, throughout our, our lunch here. Um, I work with American Farmland Trust. I've been with American Farmland Trust since 2014. So moving into the, my 10th year coming soon, uh, which is really exciting. When I first started, we actually uh, were in the middle of launching a farmland access program, which was only focused in the Hudson Valley initially. And it was called the Hudson Valley Farm Lake Network. And it was an, it was an effort to address the serious challenges that farmers face in terms of finding farmland, as well as the, the challenge they face on the other end of their farming career, which is transitioning out of farming, uh, being able to retire, being able to 
ideally a lot of them want to stay involved in farming, being able to take and be taken care of as they age and see their land and their legacy stay uh, stay in place. Uh, it may transition, but to see it stay in farming. Um, so those are really two significant challenges for all farmers. Um, so we started that program a long time ago and over the years that eventually uh, showed a lot of success. And in 2018, went to a statewide program called Farmland for New Generation New York. So that's where most of my work is. And that's where the Farmland Access Fund we've been talking about will be sort of situated to complement the services that we already provide to farmers and farmland owners around the state to help with those challenges. With my other hat on, uh, I'm a, I guess I'm, I don't think I qualify any longer as a young farmer, sad, mm -hmm. sad day, but once upon a time I was, uh, but I am still relatively a beginning farmer. I didn't grow up on a farm and not from a farm family and uh, first started farming in the Hudson Valley in 2006 and um, excited to tell a little bit more about maybe some of my farming story to the, to the extent that it's relevant and of interest to folks here in terms of what it looks like for a farmer to try to find farmland. And I think there's a lot of generalizable parts of, of what happened for me and some of the challenges and some of the things that ended up working out and what that looks like on the farmer side of seeking land and trying to find it when you don't have farmland within your family and you don't necessarily have the means of buying farmland. Um, and then to be able to kind of move from there to see what it would be like for other farmers in similar situations where either price is a significant barrier or where they're facing other challenges. So. Excited to be here, excited for the interest from Upstate Curious and for everybody on the call in terms of supporting these types of projects and happy to chat more about it. All right. Awesome. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Carissa. I appreciate it. Um, I, I want to say that like everybody is welcome to ask questions or com throw comments in there the whole time. Feel free to do that in the chat. I will, I will be our moderator so I can, you know, you, you guys don't have to look at that. Um, if other of you have answers to the questions that are asked. I see at least one other farmer, and I know there's a few other farmers in the in the questions, in the um, participants here, then you are welcome to also absolutely more than welcome to throw your two cents in. And I think that um, one of the things that for me was interesting, and I, I didn't say that that was, that was part of how I got to this, was that we did buy a property in uh, Accord, New York, my husband and I, that I hadn't, I mean, it was being used on a relatively small scale to grow seeds and um, had been used, but really decades prior as a dairy farm. And so I kind of got to this point where it was like, I knew that we wanted to, I, it felt like a very special place that deserved to be handled very carefully. <laughs> and I felt really at a, you know, to some extent, a little bit of a loss when I was looking for resources. Um, once you find a, I feel like once you get into the network through one of these people, Cornell Cooperative Extension, whatever your local one is, is often the very best place to start. Although you can also write to us now at Upstate Curious. We will, Krista just gave me a great list of, you know, like, we will find you the right people to talk to if you have any questions about this, like any aspect of it, not just this grant, but also farming in general, other resources. Um, but I did the non-operating landowner class and it was so interesting because it was a bunch of people who had land. Some of them, it was family land actually that they had come back to and that it, but they were not currently farming it. And um, it was with American Farmland Trust in Glenwood, which is another amazing organization in Cold Spring. And it was like, I feel like as much as I felt like I was lightly knowledgeable and I still am very lightly knowledgeable compared to any American farmland trust people or any of you who do this full time, it was still like pretty, um, no shocking is the right word, but maybe uh, to, to speak with farmers and hear about just all of the challenges that they face on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of you know, the, the weather, the price of inputs, the price of what they're producing, like a disease can come through and totally change their day. I mean, it's a change their year and it is so much, it's a ton when you're doing it on a smaller scale, which almost everybody in the Hudson Valley is, there's so much risk involved and so much work and so much, this is not, we're not, we're not talking about here, these huge, you know, farms in the Midwest where there's just like acres and acres and acres of flat land and you can be driving tractors and extracting all the nutrients from the soil and making it so it's not, you know, never productive again, but you know, who's, who's counting. Um, we're talking about, you know, a lot of smaller farmers and 
I saw how much work that they had to put into when they were, you know, started to learn about that when they were just leasing land. You know, even if you're going to lease land to improve the soil, they're going to build, you know, improvements. And sometimes they do that with the help of the landowner. Th th that's another discussion, basically. And I remember thinking like, wow, I wish they could just own that land. <laughs> like, I wish they could just like, if you're going to put that much time and effort into it to have that kind of security, even if, as Chris has said, this is, this is not a program that is meant to necessarily, or it's not meant to have the farmer build wealth on the rising cost of the land. The idea is that the land will remain affordable for future farmers also. It doesn't mean that they might not build some wealth actually, because over time, affordable is still more than what you bought it for 30 years ago, possibly. Um, but that they would have the security and just the different, it's a different feeling of really owning your own spot, you know, and you know that you're going to get those investments. So those investments are going to be benefiting you and what you're trying to do. And I love the, I mean, we had our, um, when we did our intro discussion to our group about this, we, they, um, our AFT friends here brought on, um, or had invited a number of the women from, or the Orbers from ah, Iridescent Earth Collective, sorry, choking over here, who are about to open a farm or a new farm, not new, take over a farm in Delaware County. And it was so inspiring to hear their story of farming and moving that land and having another layer about food insecurity in the Bronx, which is where they come from, being satisfied through this. And I don't know if you guys want to, I think if, if either, you know, I don't know if you want to talk about that story a little bit or just like, cause I, I think there's something that's like somebody asked, can somebody start from scratch? Are you looking for already active farmers? And I guess that is sort of the question. Like, would you, would you want, would you yeah. want, would you want someone who knows something about farming or is it like, Absolutely. let me jump in and answer that. And then Tim, I'd love to have you kind of provide some background. I, I think that'd be helpful around the Tom Hudson river Haven and iridescent earth collective yeah. cats greater. Great Northern Catskill Agrarian Alliance project, which really has informed our New York Farmland Access Fund. Yeah. But Gigi, just want to address the question, um, can someone start from scratch? So this program's really looking to work with farmers who, you know, we're, we're saying new and beginning, but not necessarily farmers who are completely green or starting from scratch. There are wonderful programs that Glenwood, you know, and Grow NYC have that, that train farmers and provide internship and apprenticeship opportunities. This program's looking to bring farmers who've graduated from those opportunities or from other, you know, self-led internships, apprenticeships, uh, and, and get them onto land permanently. In part because it's, um, that, that can be a really big stretch, uh, meaning, you know, farmers who have been farming for two to three years will know by the end of three years, for example, whether this is their career choice or not. And before that, they might not. So, so we're really targeting that um, that second stage. Um, and I can get into more of that or answer other questions if that's not completely clear. And I should say too, you know, we don't have we're, we're building out kind of an advisory circle internally that will help us, uh, you know, recruit and then work with and 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 vet farmer applicants, we really are at the beginning stages of that. So I'm not saying that three years is like an exact criteria, but um, definitely kind of targeting, you know, farmers who have made this a career choice and are are looking, you know, for, for land into perpetuity. Not to say that, you know, the farmers that get into onto one of these projects wouldn't be able to transition or move or, or, or sell their that property over the course of time, but really looking to provide a more permanent tenure. And this could be for farmers who have been working for 20 years, right? But who have been like leasing the land. Absolutely. Year, exactly. Okay. exactly. That would actually be a really exciting farmer to help because, you know, if they've been a farm worker for 20 years and are ready, you know, to, to really jump in as an owner themselves. And, and oftentimes, and I, I've seen that, and I'm sure Tim has too, dozens of times where it's just, it's the affordability issue, you know, it, this is, this is the money that's going to help us jump that hurdle of affordability to, to really help those farmers who, you know, have proven their craft and, um, and their commitment and want to do this will, will help them get the land to, to really do it. Well, and we have two questions and someone asked if, um, Cheryl asked if this would include urban farmers and that, I mean, that the first Absolutely. model project is where urban 
Absolutely. They came yes, to and I think it, that's right. Hearing about the mutual aid work that Iridescent Earth Collective has been doing, I think could shed some light on that, so. And then another question um, from Ashley, who is an agricultural economic development specialist with CCE and a farmer, clarifying if this fund of, is live and if there are guidelines or criteria developed. So let me just also clarify this because I, I'm pretty sure this is true. People aren't going to apply for money, right? They're going to apply to be able to buy the land. That's correct. That's correct. And the land will be a fair price. Um, it's not a gift. It's, uh, you know, it'll be, and it'll vary project to project in terms of what affordability looks like. Of course, it's our goal at AFT. It's part of our mission to make that land as affordable as possible, but it's not a gift of money to buy land per se. We're going to secure the land. And then, you know, through our Farmland for a New Generation New York network, which we have, uh, you know, we're already connected to many farmers. Um, we That network has, I think, 33 regional navigators across New York State that we work with. Um, those are kind of, those, those entities are our uh, eyes on the ground and, and ears to the ground in terms of the farmers looking for land. So we'll be working with them. And then Ashley, uh, the criteria is in the process for applicants is in the process of being developed. Um, this is kind of, we're celebrating today this official launch because we've announced that the fund is public. Um, we're already getting some inquiries from farmers. That's great. Keep them coming. Uh, we're, we're creating a list and Upstate Curious is also, you know, has put a list, um, an option to, to, join a list to stay updated on these things. So we're really, frankly, just celebrating the fact that we've got that two and a half, we've got more than two and a half million dollars now to begin our first project. Um, so, so, so more to come for farmers about what the exact criteria are. And like I said, this advisory circle or committee that we're creating, we'll be creating those, uh, putting those, those uh, criteria together. Um, it's not really, you know, what I do, but uh, we'll be getting that out to everyone um, soon. So and the question is, that, so it's essentially going to be used from Shea to warehouse farmland until applicants move through the process and can purchase. I'm not sure if I understand the word warehouse, but we're kind of, but we are. Like set it you know, aside, maybe, I guess. We're holding, right. So maybe, yes, the, you know, the, we're, we're buying time, right. We're, we're, we're protecting land so that it's not developed and we're sort of taking it off the market and holding that until, you know, we're able to help connect the right farmers to the right project. But I think the idea is that people, oh yeah, somebody said, what's the expected timeline for applicants? But I mean, the idea would be to have, I guess, depending on how complicated the first lot that's, or, you know, the first land that's bought is, but to have people be able to apply next year, this year? So don't have a timeline right now. I mean, like I said, right now, you know, be in touch, make sure you're on our list. Um, the list that Megan sent or, or reach, feel free to reach out to me directly. I'll put my contact info in the chat. I'm making a list of folks that I'm starting to talk to as well. Um, <laughs> I can say that, you know, we've uh, looked at a couple of properties in the Hudson Valley. One looks really quite promising, but we, and, and there will be a big splashy announcement when we have that ready to go. Uh, we don't have that ready to go today. Today is really just about celebrating that we've made it to here. We've made it to, to this point of, of raising that initial pot of money um, in about one year, which is exciting. And there's a lot of momentum. So, and we also hope that all of you will help us um, continue to, you know, meet that pledge, help Upstate Curious meet that pledge. And I'm sure we'll have time to talk about that. Well, and I think that this also, one of the, one of the things that makes us a little complicated, not, not complicated, but the, the, one of the, one of the other purposes of the fund is that it can be, I know at least one person who I see as a participant looking at um, discussing conservation or, or, you know, easements and very like the, it can take a long time to come to like, to come to terms about like also how the land is going to be conserved and if it's going to be preserved for agriculture, if they're going to be some part of it can be used for affordable housing. Is there like, there's different organizations. And I know this first piece of land is, is going to be with the Dutchess Land Conservancy or Columbia County Land Conservancy. And I think that that one of the challenges for buying farmland, if it doesn't have an easement on it already or conservation easement already, is that it's, it's a, it can be at market rate prices. And then the farmer hasn't gotten paid for the difference between a market rate price and the price with the easement on it. And so this is, this is sort of 
AFT is kind of going through this process and getting that land. If it if it is already if it has that already and could be offered at lower agricultural prices, then that could be quicker. But I think it it does depend a lot on the land, is my understanding. So, I would I would think of it as AFT as a a transitional owner to attend to both the the financial challenge for a farmer in getting the land. So as you were saying there, Megan, that. Uh, it can be a challenge for somebody to acquire land at its full development value. And so if a land trust is able to put a conservation easement on a farm, which essentially extinguishes uh, the right to develop that farm for purposes, in this case, other than farming, uh, it, it will reduce the value of that farm. But the period of time is often a couple of years. Uh, it can go a little faster, but sometimes it's more than even two or three years to get an easement through. So to have a landowner who will work with a farmer and support them throughout that period of time um, while they maybe develop their business and are getting started and, and feel secure that that land will eventually come back to them so they can make investments like you were saying at the beginning of the call and they can invest in a well, they can invest in putting in electrical, they can invest in the infrastructure they need to run their business, they can start to make their home there. So for them to be able to do all those things uh, with security and then having a, a light at the end of the tunnel of the land value will be going down, they'll be able to hopefully afford it and plan around that and then know also that into the future that land will always be available for other farmers. Um, so I think part of it is addressing that affordability and part of it is the timing. <clears throat> it's just really hard for somebody to find a, a landowner who's going to be able to work with them through that. So I would say it's actually a little bit of a distinction from what how I would hear like the warehousing uh, way of describing, which I kind of like, but it's a little different than a warehouse because it's actually, it's not just holding it and storing it. Somebody's going to be ideally actively farming and using it during that period of time. So it's really AFT trying to step in and provide a that financial and time-based support mm -hmm. so that something can get established. And I would just add to to the to the comment about um, you know would there be sort of opportunities for farmers to apply for those farms I th I think right now the way it's going to look is it it will depend I think some farm properties may already have farmers there who are great candidates to be able to stay there if they're not the current owners where there might be other opportunities uh, where a farm doesn't have somebody who currently is operating a business or their farm on there and there'd be the opportunity for someone to come in from from a different area in which case that would look very different so I think it's going to serve a couple of different or it's going to function within a couple of different like formats. Yeah, an interesting question that I've been sort of, I mean, I know we haven't gotten into it, like there, there, this is so new that all the details haven't been developed, but we have a question from Aaron. When you say the land will be protected, do you know what model of easement you will use? Some can be pretty restrictive in terms of what, you know, yeah. they can kind of restrict the actual operations for the farmers also. <laughs> so yeah, that's, that that's a, it's a very good question and it's a very good point. And I think I think from if we were all to like be able to zoom ourselves in the future and look back, I can't imagine that we're not we wouldn't look back and make some changes. So no matter what we do to make easements as farmer friendly as possible, I think we're always going to look back from a short of a couple of years later to 20 years later and say, oh, we didn't foresee that this particular restriction that we thought was important to be able to reduce the value of the farm so that people could afford it or that we thought would help prevent certain types of practices being done that we thought were detrimental. Now we see that there's this other way of looking at it that we could play a game there and, and you know, kind of like go down the rabbit hole, which is interesting. And we should all do as we try to make sort of permanent or difficult to change restrictions on properties. On the other hand, our intention is going to be to create and work with local land trust partners to create easements that are as farmer friendly and flexible as possible for both current farm practices as well as what may come in the future. Um, so it could be that affordability covenants go in there, things that try to restrict the value of that farm further. It could be that farming covenants that say you have to be an active farmer could be a part of those. I'm not saying they definitely would be. There are things called preemptive purchase rights that could be potentially layered onto a traditional agricultural conservation easement, which would which would say that if the owner tries to sell it to somebody who is not a farmer, the land trust who holds the easement could step in to try to buy it at farm value and then sell it to a farmer at farm value. So there's a variety of things that we can do to try to think about how do we simultaneously keep flexibility for the farmers now and in the future who will be there, but also keep that that price down and find a balance between making it as legally black and white as possible so that it can be enforced and followed and understood while keeping it as functionally flexible so that the farmers can do what they need to do to succeed. Awesome. Megan, can I respond to Ben's comment uh, real quick in the chat? 
been noted that the seller financing would be amazing too, if I may suggest. You may already be thinking along those lines, but that could be massive for us farmers given the interest rates now. And just want to clarify that AFT is not a bank and, and we're not getting into the banking um, industry, but you know we do have a lot of partners, you know, Farm Credit East and Walden Mutual, relatively new partner, um, who are farmer first and farmer forward, and we're working with them. They're excited about this project. Um, so more to come on that, and, and but that's certainly, we are thinking about it and, and we want this to work for, for farmers. And so we're gonna do everything we can to, to make sure that, that those financing options are there. We know that's a big part of it. Yeah, yeah, and no, I, <clears throat> I just wanna play off that a little bit too, which is to say, yeah, Part of the, the idea of this Farmland Affordability Fund is to both help folks get onto those properties or find them and be able to affordably access them, but it's the additional services that'll be there that I think goes in, in line with that question with, with what Carissa just said, which is to work with those farmers to try to find the most, like the, the best alignment between the financing options that are out there and to be helping them navigate all the options, consider what the rates and the terms would be so that they could set themselves up to be able to carry that whatever the debt might be in the future if they're doing a loan, but also to be thinking about the business planning supports, they can factor that into their plans and all the other types of what sometimes are called wraparound services to help them not just get onto those properties, but find success there and be able to afford to stay there and, and have a successful business and make it their home and do all the other things they might want to do there. And I'm going to also put a link to, I mean, if you guys, if, if somebody doesn't know about the, um, the farmland finder that is such a i mean that is the farmland for new generation that is such a that is such a useful resource and there is a big page of resources also that are all kinds of things from you know from technical support to different you know financing and i just sent this to somebody yesterday i'm going to pop that right there too and then tim do you want to tell us a story of some sort either your, your experience or the, I think that, I mean, since I already was like teasing the iridescent earth collective turning into the Catskill Northern. Yeah. You would, you, would you want me to talk about what the folks are doing there with the iridescent earth collective? I thought that was, and, thought that was such an interesting, I thought it was such an interesting story because it was also about the, the farmer who was there for so long and like loved the land for, well, yeah, anyways, I won't. Yeah, no, 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 jump in. Um, <laughs> happy to talk about that story. And I, and I think it's actually a great story to tell, uh, well, for a variety of reasons. Uh, there are a lot of really cool aspects to it that I think are compelling and interesting. It's also a good story to tell because even though it's not a farmland access fund project formally, um, it isn't our first project, it has so many elements in common with it. But in, in this particular story, um, so there's this existing farmer, um, sorry, one moment. Am I still there? Great. Sorry, my, my phone changed for a yeah. moment. Yeah. Um, so there's an existing farmer who's been on this farm now. It's uh, around 200 acres in the Catskills. It's right uh, along the property actually is on either side of a river that's flowing through there. And it's, it's really beautiful. Uh, they've been there for four generations. He's grown up there. He's been farming there for his whole life. He knows that land in a way that it's hard to, if you don't meet somebody like his name's Tom. If you don't meet somebody like Tom, who's been a part of a place for generations, I mean, he obviously has only been there for his generation himself, but he connects to that property and tells stories that his parents and grandparents talked about, like as if he experienced them, could have been there his entire life. And he knows that place in and out. He doesn't have children himself, um, but he's been a really committed farmer his whole life. And he's also been really committed to stewarding that land. So early on, he's been part of watershed protection programs that is part of how New York City has some of the cleanest unfiltered water in the world is because of all these amazing aquifers surrounded by land that has uh, good forest land on it or farmers and others who are stewards on the land to allow water to be filtered naturally and then it makes its way down through those aqueducts to the city. Tom's been a part of those types of projects and one of the first farmers who, who protected his farmland and, and took all sorts of other initiative to make sure that he was keeping the water clean. That was everything that was moving through his farmland and going into that river. So he's been really kind of a pioneer in a lot of different ways and he doesn't have any children. So he's been trying to figure out what to do with his farm for, for quite a long time. Chris mentioned this group of farmers who make up the Iridescent Earth Collective. Uh, they describe themselves as queer, black, queer, trans, black and Latinx farmers who are working to do mutual aid projects between downstate and upstate to make a connection to the communities that they work with closely in the city, but also that they have a passion and background with farming and are bringing that to uh, to bear on this project. So they have 
been working with Tom, who they, they call Tommy. So they've been working with Tommy for a really long time uh, to build a relationship. They connected with some local partners in the area, some other farmers, um, to be able to start incubating a business there, start building this relationship with Tom, and to hopefully to be able to transition onto that property. AFT is going to be playing somewhat of a similar role to what we would be doing within a farmland access fund of trying to be a transitional owner of that property so that they can develop a program, which in this case is going to be a, a slightly different thing. It's called an agrarian commons, but it's a different land access model wherein the land will be held as like something like a nonprofit entity, but we'll hold it for a really long time indefinitely so that farmers can have long-term secure leases there uh, and be able to operate their businesses. Uh, and lots of farmers will probably be on the same property doing independent, but probably mutually supportive businesses. So it's a pretty cool project. It's pretty unique. And we're excited to be able to do this project as something like a farmland access fund project as we're simultaneously getting the farmland access fund itself launched. Yeah, I yeah, love that was a very inspiring talk with them. And I think that, um, I guess, what would you say? I mean, what would you say are some of the biggest challenges around land access for either new farmers or farmers who've been, who've been leasing land? What would you, I mean, what, what are you seeing, Tim, when you're talking to people? Well, I mean, just being can, I mean, uh, one of the biggest ones is money. I mean, just land is, is not typically affordable, especially not on a farm income, um, to be able to buy land and service the debt on that land and simultaneously invest in all the startup costs of operating a farm business. Um, and then, you know, there's typically a lot of downward pressure on food prices. And so to be able to combine all those factors and be able to afford that is really challenging, even more so if you don't have any family money, if you don't have family land. Um, so I think just the money side of it is an extreme challenge. Uh, gaining enough experience is a challenge. Um, just being able to, not everybody can afford to work for minimum wage or and oftentimes less than minimum wage to gain the experience to be able to then qualify for certain programs or move through and, and build your way up. Um, it's difficult to save enough while you're farming to be able to do all those types of projects too. So, and, and invest in, in yourself and your business. So I think the, the money side of it, the experience side is really challenging finding land is a real hard thing to do also. Um, yeah. Just, you might think it's easy, oh, just go find some farmland, but to find land that has the right kinds of soils, is in the right location for your markets, that also you're gonna feel like is where your home is gonna be and you're gonna feel welcome there. Um, and, and knowing about it, so much farmland moves through word of mouth and between farmers or between other folks who know them already. So it can be challenging to just find that land then you also have to deal with, right? starting that business, being able to afford it and all those things. I, I think those are a few big ones. Um, it's sort of a, this is another one of those areas you can spend some time in and there's, it's, it gets more and more complicated as you dig into it, but those are a few of the really big ones. And do you, I mean, who, who are the people becoming new farmers now? <laughs> Why did you decide to do this? Um, well, so I, yeah, I, I started farming because I was doing a lot of outdoor work. I was doing outdoor ed and habitat management work. I was doing some teaching um, and I was really enjoying all that. But I was like, how do I do something that combines working with plants and animals, being outside, but also working with people and ideally producing something or doing something that people just need? And I was like, oh, what about food? What about farming? And it just started farming. And like Carissa said, she was like, you know, by two or three years, you probably have a sense of how committed you are. Within the first month of farming there, I knew that I, I loved it and that I wanted to continue farming and that I was really passionate about it. It took a while to continue down that road to be like, OK, I can see a way by which I could maybe make this my my life, my profession. But uh, it, it took a long time to get there. I think there are so many farmers out there. And I think a lot of folks don't know just how many new and beginning farmers there are that are looking for land, but just that aren't able to to access it. So they're, they're out there coming from all sorts of different backgrounds. Um, and the, I think one of the things that we feel like will happen is if we're able to make opportunities available, pe people are there, the farmers are there. It's more that they just can't get the, get the right access to land. So the more opportunities there are for them to get affordable, secure land arrangements, the, the more clear it'll be that, that they're around and they're looking. Oh, what do you think about, I mean, this, the, I'm trying to figure out how to put this, but it sort of relates to the question about, about the, you know, brand new farmers. I mean, I, I, I did a, 
I did a, I did this course about entrepreneurship a million years ago ish in New York city. And it was, it was interesting. It's a course called Webo workshop and business opportunities. And it was founded in the, in the sixties. There was a, I think it was a Jewish attorney and a black attorney kind of got together and were like, small businesses traditionally have been passed from, you know, like, you know, family, like within a family. So you learned the business because you were working in the business. And that was just like how people learned how to do things for a long time. And so they sort of were looking at the political situation of the time and thought without, without economic resources, people are not going to have, they're not going to have political power. They're not going to have, you know, the chance to have some kind of a, a bigger, impact or be, you know, like just, they they were just trying to, they were trying to figure out a way to essentially teach entrepreneurship, which now feels like there are like millions of courses on entrepreneurship, you know, but they were just like, at the time, they're like, the way you learn is by like working in the corner store that your parents own, or you worked in the wood shop that your parents own. And that's how you do it. To me that, that has just resonated so much when I've, when we've been talking about farming, but it almost like a, a whole other layer of it, because it's not just that, you know, the business as a farmer, but you also like Tommy know, like the actual land and know what the like microclimate is of that particular spot and know all these things. I think it's, so I think to me, it's really interesting to see like, how hard is it to teach, to teach or to, to pass those skills on to this generation of new farmers so that once they have the land, they, they do succeed. Or what do you think has allowed you to succeed? Or or, are you just like, I had two jobs for the first 10 years, which is also true, by the way, of a lot of entrepreneurs. Like, you know, a lot of people starting any business have two jobs. Yeah, um, well, in in my own experience, it certainly was, uh, it was an intentional move after I I took about, it was about five years where I was looking for land before we got onto the property. And then it was another five years where we were in a lease with an option to purchase arrangement. Um, So it was about a 10 year until we, we were able to purchase the land um, that we're on now with an easement on it, with some restrictions to say that it should always be going to farmers and things like that, um, which were also beneficial to me in terms of being able to afford the land. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know if I feel like, uh, you know, I would say I'm a success. I think we got onto the farm. I feel really good about that. It always feels like, you know, when you're operating your own business, they're always like, well, a few well-timed things could really not derail what we have going right now. But but I feel like we've worked really hard and we've achieved some of what we set out to do so far. So I feel really, I'm proud of that. But I also know that I'm part of a team, like all of us are when we're farming and we're, we're trying to find our properties and we're working with people to do everything from the business startup and on is like, there's so many people we work with who support us. So I think part of what it's been for me is like, and and I think what other farmers have when it works is they're you're, you're gritty, you're perseverant, you're gonna you're gonna just be ready to work really hard. In my case, you know, for those first few years, I was working full time still with AFK. I tr- I'm, I'm part time with American Farmland Trust, while I also have the farm, but it was ninety hour weeks for or ninety hour weeks for years for about three years nonstop, and that's burnout mode for sure if you keep that up for too long so it's 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 uh but it was a strategy to say in order to afford it in order to get things started in order to make investments in the business need to have need to have other sources of income other farmers do it in all sorts of creative ways i know a lot of farmers who simultaneously bought their land started their business built their house on the land did everything and it's bananas it's crazy what they do and how talented they are but it's a lot of work it's a lot of stress it's a lot of skimping Um, I think in order to teach all that, yeah, you're right. There's a certain amount of like, you can teach all the basics that are going to go into how do you operate a business? How might you operate a farm? How do you think about marketing? How do you think about soils and the ways that, that those could impact the, the type of production you're doing? Um, but to some extent it's a, it's a combination of, you can do all that book learning. You also just have to do a lot of the work. Ideally you get a chance to do that while you're working with somebody else uh, for a while. And then some of it's the experimentation that happens on everybody's individual farm is why they're also unique and a little bit different is they have to make it work in they, where they are, where their microclimate is with what each year delivers to them with how markets change. Um, so it's got what most businesses have, plus those that sort of the variable of the weather and the, the living landscape that their business is a part of. It's like a ski mountain, but much more important. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Skiing's fun, but you know. Food is yes, and somebody just asked me if if this is going to be recorded, and yes, I'm at, we're recording it. We're going to send it to everybody who who joined. So definitely don't worry about that. Um, yeah, I think it's I I I think that for me, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna and maybe I shouldn't say this because maybe whatever I'm just gonna say it anyways. Is that like it's it's like the 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 
either the problem or the opportunity here seems so big that it's like, it almost is like insurmountable that all this like work would go into like maybe in the end, helping five to 10 new people kind of take over this land. And if the other option of doing nothing is clearly worse, you know, and I think that that's where it's, this is one of those problems that to me, a little bit like climate change with this is, which this is very interlinked with that just feels like so big that you're sort of like, what do we do? And I I think that one of the ways that I'm thinking of this, this project in particular is that this is sort of like a, I don't know, like a little lighthouse that's sort of like saying like, Hey, look over here, look over here, like learn about regenerative agriculture. Like even just learn a little bit about it. So you can see that there are ways to farm that improve the soil instead of depleting the soil and, and why that would be important actually. And why you might want to if, if that is important to you, why you might want to pay the farmer more or buy the more expensive vegetables, you know, that follow those kind of values. And I think that it's, um, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, how do, how do you guys get like, do you ever get like overwhelmed or are you just like, or is it because you're like seeing people and you're meeting them and seeing their lives change and seeing them get the technical support they need? And because AFT does so many other things that are, you know, is it, how, how do, how do you balance that? I'll, I'll jump in first too, and then I'd love to, yeah, to hear your response yeah. too. I just, in, in response to the five to 10, you know, of course we're hoping to help five to 10 farmers over five years, um, ambitious goal, but we think it's manageable. And, you know, not that every farmer is going to run a CSA, for example, but let's just say that five of these farmers do and five of these farmers, and I'm just going to use simple round numbers to help us, you know, but those five farmers are each reaching 100 people through their CSA. So that's already 500 people. It is, I just feel like farmers are holding our rural communities together. They're feeding our rural communities, our, our kids, our families. What could be more important than that? Like, in addition to caring for, you know, the land that's also, you know, protecting our, our watersheds and, you know, protecting our soils, which we know are, are degraded and need that care. So while the number seems small, I feel like the impact is really huge. And when we're talking about impact in our backyards, it's even bigger. So I just, I want to share that, you know, and, and we have seen because we, we work with farmers all the time and, and, you know, through our Farmland for a New Generation New York work have helped make I think it's like 136 matches over the course of 10 years. Like that's, it, it can sound like a, a small number, but it's been so changing for those farmers and for the communities that they're in. So mm. can't underscore that enough. Well, and they're probably the ones also offering the apprenticeship, you know what I mean? Offering the apprenticeships and having people come onto the land and learn how to do it. And I would imagine exactly. are more likely to like be happy to share what they're learning about being a newer farmer with, you know, with other people. So I, that, I could imagine that ripple effect would actually be pretty and it's, and it's why we want the, you know, some of the first farmers that we're working with to be BIPOC QT farmers, because we know there's such a need for more examples of those types of farmers to, to again, you, 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 um, you know, you can be what you see and we need more. We, we know that there are BIPOC and QT farmers in the Hudson Valley, obviously. Let's give them this opportunity to share with others you know, as an example and, and just bring even more folks like that into the fold. Love it. Tim, what were you going to say? I feel like you yeah. I, well, I, I build off what Chris said, which is, I think there's often some balance to be found between like the total number of people you can serve and the, like the level of intensity or depth with which you can go in serving them. Yeah. So I think, yes, it's going to be a smaller total number. Um, but the, 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 the significance of the work to them is going to be huge and 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 sort of life changing in terms of getting that kind of secure and affordable access so it's still a really big thing just on a on a small number but that acreage is going to stay in play indefinitely so as it goes over time it's going to become cumulative even that what well, chris shared that total number of farmers uh, you know over 120 something 130 something farmers in the in the last four or five years with the farmland for new generation new york program that's over eight thousand acres and you just keep giving that time and it's going to just build and build so i think that's one one point to make i think uh you, when you were saying that like yeah how do you not let it get you down it's kind of it's so much you can feel overwhelming i, I have this 
a little quote on my wall, which I'm, I'm going to paraphrase because I don't remember it, even though it's short, but it's something along the lines of like, you're not required to complete the work, but nor are you allowed to desist from it, which is like, this is important mm -hmm. work. You may not finish it, but working towards it is, I think, the goal and continuing that work and not letting it down. Um, and I think the other thing that helps to to uh, keep that positive attitude and things like that is meet farmers. Go talk to farmers that you know. They're, they're optimistic. They're working hard. They're going to keep at it. And I think like they they provide you with a lot of energy. They provide me with a lot of energy, my peers and the other people that I, I'm friends with that I know that I get to meet through my work with American Farmland Trust. Like, their their hard work, the things that they're striving towards, they keep. I mean, they're they're motivating, and so I think just like take time to meet farmers, and I think that's that'll help you keep going with it. I think that's I I love everything that both of you guys just said, and I would say that I think that it's whatever. This is more like esoteric, but it's maybe a product of like the world we live in, where we're online and can see everything happening in the whole world all at once. But you're right. Like if I think about like if one if there was one new farm in our town, you know, that would, or like a, a farm didn't get lost in our town or like came back to life. Like I'm hoping ours will someday like that, that has such a big impact around on um, everybody around it. And, and you would know, I mean, it's one of the things I love about living in a rural area. And one of the things I loved about weirdly living in Brooklyn, where I had the same feeling in my little neighborhood, a lot of the time where you see the people, you, you know them. Um, and I think it's, a. I think that there's, um, I don't know. I, I think that people don't know that, that I, I will, it, it feels like we're at a moment anyways in our, you know, and human humanity or whatever, where there, there's just a lot of changes and we're going to be facing a lot of, we are facing a lot of challenges globally and here in the U S and, um, I think that we there, I was just at a meeting this morning where they were talking about the, you know, the number of percentage of people who live below the poverty line in Ulster County is I think 13.7%, which is higher than the national average, but the percentage of people who um, get SNAP benefits is, is, is way higher than that actually. And food insecurity is not something that is not happening in our areas. That is a challenge, you know, and I think that when we see also the local farmers that are working with the gleaning organizations and the, the, the food pantries, which happens, it's, it's, it does become this like complete, I don't know, just like a very, a soup, such an intact, like if a, whatever, if like a cell phone store closed or if like a, if a real estate office closed, You'd probably be, everyone's probably okay. You know, we're probably all good. But like, if, if we lose that farm, you know, I mean, not our, you know, real estate's really, I mean, real estate's really important, but no, I mean, you'd probably be a okay. You could find another realtor, but like, it's not the same as somebody who's been caring for that land or figuring out what kind of barn they need for their livestock and what, what, you know, what building the network of people. And I know, I mean, I've learned from, from um, Becky Collins, who's on this call here, also about just, you know, all the other, the other aspects of finding, are there the right places to take your animals to be slaughtered and processed that are, that are, that will do it in a way that you feel good about, that you feel like is the same, the, you know, the same quality that you're raising the animal in. And there's just all of the, this whole infrastructure only works when there's enough people you know, producing, producing the food. So, um, so I'm getting a little bit rambling here, but I think that it's, um, like I said, I think that one, a big part of this project is going to be, I, I, I hope a big part of this project is getting other people to learn about this and, and to talk to farmers. And I know that in our town, um, we are, there's a new, uh, agricultural, committee and our town board. And there's been some convening of stuff, but, you know, to some extent around some land subdivision questions and things, but it's like, I think that that is, that is that talking to a farmer is pretty damn important to figure out like what, what is actually going on. So maybe in, in that respect, I'll shut up and see if anybody has any questions for either the farmer and, you know, program officer, Tim and, or Krissa also about the, the program or why it exists, or wishes, or thoughts, challenges.
this has been so informative. Thank you. I'll send an email because I'd love to be further involved. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. And we're going to be, I mean, we're going to be having, we're talking to local, you know, we're talking to different businesses about having products or some of the products that are sold provide information about this and give a certain percentage. We're going to be having probably a big dinner in Accord in October where there's going to be a bunch of things to get people involved with this at every level, um, whether it is helping to raise awareness or actually donating money. If you want to donate, you know, the full million right now and just like keep my life from being stressful for the next five years, Carissa put her email a little bit earlier. So that's cool. Um, Although if you do that, we're going to immediately just raise the goal. So I know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. And that's a good, a good, if you do mind, I'll segue just into, yeah. you know, we, we really, you know, we're again, so grateful for Upstate Curious's platform and amazing pledge. And, and we really have a big challenge ahead of us in terms of raising even more money to, to add to this revolving fund and help even more farmers. That's our goal. Um, so if there are any leads or anyone on this call who, you know, is in a position to make a gift, would love to talk. My email's in the chat. Um, yep, thanks, Megan. That's our donate page. Any donations made through that link that Megan just popped in the chat, go directly to this fund. Uh, we'll be sharing that widely over the course of the next, you know, year, just as we really ramp up and uh, raise awareness. But um, the questions have been great. I feel like the engagement has been great. It's great to to get to know just by name a couple of farmers on this call. Um, this is again like kind of our first, you know, foray into outreach with this outside of putting press release out and and really it's just beginning. But we want to hear from folks. We want to know that this is valuable, um, both for farmers and hopefully for farmland owners. As you know, farmers who are ready to transition out of this work, just like Tom Hudson was and is that Tim has had described, uh, you know, this is a really important resource for them too. Oftentimes farmers don't have retirement funds, their money is in the land. And so this, you know, creates a transition plan for them. Um, and, and we're just, you know, frankly, so grateful to be able to do this work. We feel like it's important work. Uh, we hear that from the folks we serve every day um, and we couldn't do it without the interest and without all of you. Tim, do you have any final thoughts, words? I actually thought I saw somebody who was just about to speak uh, on my screen. Somebody popped up. Mm -hmm. Oh, might Ashley be... Tully, maybe? Or she might yes. be talking to somebody else. Oh. Maybe so. Uh, well, I, all I was going to say is, in terms of some wrap-up, was that in addition to everything Chris had, had added there, that we're also available. So if, if there are farmers on the call that have questions and want to dig into projects they're working on, even if it's not a farmland access fund project, um, but they're wanting to chat with somebody about business financial planning, finding farmland in a separate way, uh, financing options, technical support around the lease, whatever it could be, uh, we're available to, to chat with you and, you know, um, or connect you with others in your area, depending on where you are. So anyway, reach out if you're a landowner in this group, or if you become a landowner in the future and you're not farming your property, but you wanna keep it in, in agriculture, reach out. We're happy to have chats, whether you're currently doing this or whether you're planning to do it. Um, so I, I'm available. You can get in touch with me uh, through, you know, Megan, I think you have my contact, Chris, you have my contact. So happy to chat with anyone who's on the call now and do follow up. And you can always write to info at upstatecurious.com. If you can't remember anything else, just like remember info at upstatecurious.com and we will make sure it gets to the right, to the right place for sure. Um, and we can add, you know, we might want to add some, actually some other contact information and links to the New York, to the, um, the Farmland Finder resources and stuff on our page on our website. So yeah, that's also brand new and hopefully, and not hopefully, but we'll be continuing to grow. So any other questions? Can you guys hear me? Oh. Is it working now? Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry. I had my mic on a strange setting from previously. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you so much for hosting. Thank you, Megan, for stepping up and it's such a generous pledge. I think that's great. Um, and thank you for answering all my questions. I have a couple of farmlands that I'd love to pass along. So I'll connect with you, Carissa, and I'll, I'll look up Jerry as well. But thank you. Hey, awesome. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thanks, Ashley. All right.
Well, thank you guys. Thank you, Carissa and Tim, and for you know all of the hard work that has gotten to this <laughs> to this point where you know we just had to say yes, and now our our work together begins. Um, and yeah, I'm really I'm really excited, really happy to do this with you guys, and looking forward to seeing a lot of other people on this call or listening to this recording. I hope you guys get involved also. So yeah, here we go. Here we go. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Megan. Bye. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Thank Bye. you.